Today on the Texas Health Out Loud podcast, we're talking about a different kind of health care approach called upstreaming. It not only addresses the physical ailment of a patient, but the social and economic factors that tend to negatively affect a person's health. Dr. Rishi Manchanda will join us to talk about this socially responsible form of health care. He's a primary care physician who is leading the charge on upstreaming and is the author of The Upstream Doctors. We'll be talking to him next on Texas Health Out Loud. From Texas Health Resources in Arlington, Texas, this is Texas Health Out Loud a medical podcast featuring industry professionals, hospital leaders, and experts discussing healthcare topics that affect you and our community. Texas Health Out Loud starts now. Hello and welcome to the Texas Health Out Loud podcast. I'm Alicia Howe. Thanks for joining us. One of the main roles of a physician is to treat what ails a patient, but what about addressing the cause of an ailment to begin with, such as environmental or economic factors? Our guest today is here to discuss just that. Dr. Rishi Manchanda is an author, physician, and healthcare leader. He is leading the charge on a new approach to healthcare called upstreaming. Dr. Manchanda, thanks for joining us today. Thank you for having me. So, Dr. Manchanda, what is it that's making us sick? Great question, big question. Um, th- there's a lot, of course, that makes us healthy, and there's a lot that makes us sick. I think the reason I'm here today and the conversations that we're finding ourselves having across the country increasingly is um, based on an awareness that what makes us sick is not just uh, what's happening within our bodies. It's not just what is happening in our doctor's offices between patients and their doctors. It's really what's happening outside the walls of the clinic. It's what's happening in our communities, in our homes. Uh, the emerging science of what's called social determinants of health I think clearly overwhelmingly now says that uh, what is happening where we live, where we eat, where we sleep, where we work, those social and environmental factors, those have more than six times the impact on our health and our sickness than anything that happens in the walls of hospitals or clinics. Now, that doesn't mean that I, hopefully as a doctor, am irrelevant, but it means that to be even more impactful as a doctor, to be even more effective as a clinic or a hospital, We should certainly think about ways to understand how those social and environmental factors play out in the lives of our individual patients. Listen better, be routine and systematic in how we take what we hear and react to it, and then reach out to partners, uh, upstream partners in the community to be able to do something about it. So what's making us sick largely is uh, where we live and where we work and where we eat, sleep, and play. And I think it's time for our healthcare system to start being able to uh, address those things. You had an epiphany as it relates to medical treatment after you met one of your patients. Tell me about her and how she changed your overall approach, maybe your philosophy to healthcare. Yeah, Veronica is uh, someone, I, I, that's not her name. I, I changed her name and um, I, I did some other things to actually um, protect her identity. But Veronica was um, someone I met and cared for when I was working in a community health center in South Los Angeles. Community health centers, as many people know, are places where up to 20 million Americans actually get their routine primary care on a daily basis. There, That's where people uh, who are uh, not insured through other means, who can't afford some of the health care services and, and that are afforded through other systems, that's where they go to receive their primary care. And mm-hmm. I was proud to have worked there in South Central Los Angeles, uh, providing primary care as a regular doc. Veronica was uh, very similar to a lot of the patients that I met, Um, a dignified woman, mother, uh, caregiver for her family, uh, working, was uh, proud of the work that she was doing and her accomplishments, including what she was doing in raising her two sons, Um, but was also struggling up against um, an environment uh, that was sometimes hard, if not harsh, right? so Veronica, for instance, came in with a splitting headache, a chronic condition for her. She had had these episodes come and go over a course of about three years. Uh, sometimes the headaches would last for days, if not weeks. Sometimes they would be a little less severe. But in each episode, she would go and seek relief. And when she went to local primary care doctors, she would get some temporary Band-Aid treatments, symptomatic relief, here's some ibuprofen, things like that. Mm. Um, Sometimes when it was really severe, she would go to the local emergency departments and she would um, seek relief, you know, for her pain and also, frankly, trying to find a diagnosis. What's causing this and why is it reoccurring? 
And uh, in Los Angeles, uh, not unlike a lot of other cities and, and regions across the country, um, she found what we all know, which is that the emergency department is not the right place to actually get a, a true kind of in-depth root cause analysis of what's going on in your home, right? The emergency department sure. is there for emergencies. And unfortunately, um, uh, that's where a lot of folks uh, sometimes can only find relief or, or care when the pain is too severe. So she would go to the emergency department and would get the pain medication that emergency doctors are used to prescribing. She would get a workup that would sometimes be very expensive, um, including blood tests and spinal taps uh, to collect spinal fluid and um, CAT scans for her head. I mean, she had the, the workup. And she, in the in the few weeks before I met her for the first time, when, before she came into my clinic, she had gone to uh, the local emergency department in Los Angeles at a major hospital three times. And uh, each time she came up short, right? She was just in pain. So when I um, had a chance to meet her, she was frankly not just uh, still suffering from her headache, but she was exasperated, right? She was just... Um, sure. Thinking about you know, how do I how do I find relief there, and and she was coming to me now as the doctor, and I was, I think Veronica was the seventeenth patient out of my thirty patient day that day, um, and uh, here I was with the twelve minutes of allotted time that I knew I had with this, with uh, with Veronica to try to figure it out. Now, that's a a pretty common story, right? Um, not just the headache, and not just uh, what Veronica went through in terms of bouncing back and forth in the healthcare system, but of the doctors, all right, who sometimes just have a few minutes to be able to understand the whole story of a person and uh, not to see them as a patient with a particular diagnosis. There's something unique that happened in that particular moment, and uh, it was based on previous experiences with people and patients like Veronica in the community that I worked in and served. What we had figured out was that um, these headaches uh, and other symptoms that many of our patients like Veronica were coming in with were linked to uh, where they lived often. In that community, in an urban environment, uh, there's a lot of mold. Uh, and, and of course, now with everything that's been happening in terms of the weather and some of these, um, what's happening with Her Harvey and with Irma, um, I, th I think it's clear we're all going to see a lot of downstream consequences of these changes in the environment right now. People have been affected immediately, and you know, there's going to be a lot of long tail mm -hmm. impacts of these things. But um, problems of you know housing insecurity and the quality of housing, problems of mold, these are things that. Uh, People in South Central Los Angeles, and again, it's not just South Central, it's other cities around the country. That was a pretty common problem, unfortunately. People were living in substandard housing. Uh, landlords were not making the necessary repairs. They often couldn't afford it, or they said they couldn't afford it. And anyway, we were seeing patients come in, and, and I got sick and tired, frankly, of taking care of patients who were sick and tired because of where they were living and uh, and only having, in my, in my own kind of toolkit, the ability just to kind of put a Band-Aid on. That was just not... Right. satisfying. So we figured out a system that was pretty radical. Our medical assistant, um, st who, that day when uh, Veronica came into the clinic, before I even saw her, the medical assistant did her job, and that job included screening Veronica for uh, living in substandard housing. Veronica, do you have problems with mold? Do you have problems with roaches? Do you have problems with water leaks? Other, other telltale signs of poor quality housing and of health risks. And Veronica said, yeah, I do have roaches, and I do have mold, and I do have water leaks. And I saw that on her chart uh, when I went to go see her. So before I even walked in the door, I had a sense that there was something going on, that this chief complaint of a headache that was on the chart of the patient I was about to see uh, may be linked to some of the risks that uh, she screened positive for, right. roaches, mold, water leaks. As a doctor, you, you, uh, you're, you're trained to think about ways to look for patterns. Um, and in the conversations and listening to Veronica and examining her, what was so uh, clear, abundantly clear, was that she had chronic allergies, chronic sinus congestion, migraines that related to the sinus congestion, and that the upstream cause of that was the mold, water leaks, and the allergens in her, in her home environment. And so the treatment plan was pretty straightforward. Let's take care of those symptoms. Here's some allergy medications, et cetera. But let's treat that upstream cause. And this is where usually most doctors and healthcare systems kind of fall short. We, we're not... We're not experts when it comes to housing, right? And right. as a doctor, I'm certainly not an expert in housing. But I do know how to consult experts for other conditions. If somebody comes in with a heart murmur, I know that I need to send that person to a cardiologist. If someone comes in with a, uh, a pancreas issue, I send them to the gastroenterologist. When someone comes in with a housing issue, I send them to a housing specialist. And so we refer them to a community health worker and um, 
a, a set of services in the community that were able to actually assess what was happening in her home, get her some remediation help, convince the landlord to make some repairs because it was in his best interest too. And uh, they ended up um, making all those changes. She came back in three months later and, and her symptoms had improved substantially. Uh, she was grateful. She was also uh -huh. angry that no one else in the emergency departments had been unable to figure this out before. And not coincidentally, um, her home was healthier too. And that meant that not only was Veronica healthier, not only was I more happy and my medical assistant more happy because we were part of the solution, and that's a pretty big deal. You know, if you're joyful in your work, that, that's a powerful thing if you're working in, in the healthcare system. But the best thing was that um, her two sons, right, the, the mother, her mother that would sometimes stay with her, their health improved too. Wow. So with one intervention, with one kind of intervention, and this is in South Central Los Angeles, this is not the pinnacle of, you know, um, <laughs> uh, you know all the fancy gadgets and machines and, and uh, resources that were available. We figured out a low cost but high yield in, uh, way to improve the lot of uh, Veronica's life and we did that for patients like her day in and day out. And that was a glimpse of what it's like to have a better quality, better standard of health care. And part of that, I'm convinced, uh, means moving upstream. So you mentioned upstream. Can you kind of explain where that term comes from? Yeah, I, I'd like to say I invented it, but I, I'm, uh, I, I, I can't because it's not true. So <laughs> I actually borrowed it from a longstanding parable, and there's vari there are variations on the theme. Uh, a lot of folks have heard you know, what it means to move upstream. Let's, um, it's a common enough saying. In the medical and the public health world, um, the, that parable is used a lot to just talk about the importance of public health. You know, we, we have, public health is about impacting health upstream, and medicine is usually downstream work. I heard this parable, and I changed it a little bit. And the, the way I changed it was by trying to reflect what I had learned in, in the front lines of healthcare in places like South LA, and then working with homeless veterans, and then working with rural immigrant communities. And each of my clinical experiences, the privileges that, that I've had, I've thought about how that the upstream parable can be modified. And the, the way I tell it is is this: um, there are three friends who come to the, the side of a river. It's a beautiful, flowing, fast-flowing river, trees all around, mountains. This idyllic scene is pierced by the sounds of people in the water. There are children, adults, the elderly in the water, and they're crying out for help. And so the three friends do what each of us would do. They jump right in to save the lives of those who need rescue. The first friend, uh, who's a particularly strong swimmer, says, I'm going to go to the edge of the waterfall that's there. I'm going to go to those who are drowning, and I'm going to rescue those. And now the rest of us in society that have amassed along the banks of the river, watching our three friends and the, uh, the people in need, we say, that makes sense. Let's give resources to that downstream rescuer. And obviously, right? Sure. We want to save people who are drowning. Uh, over time, the second friend uh, that had jumped in realizes that she could actually um, swim a little further upstream, get some of the branches from along the banks of the river, and coordinate a raft and use that raft to usher more people to safety so that not as many people need to be in need of rescue from the downstream friend. And now the rest of us along the banks of the river say, that makes sense. That's a good idea, right? Let's allocate some resources to that person. Let's call mm -hmm. it a patient centered medical home, primary care. Sure. That's, that's essentially what raft building is, right? Over time, though, those two friends, uh, they realize something's happening. Obviously, the work they're doing is noble. It's effective when they're doing it right. But they start getting tired and, and fatigued. They start realizing this tide of need. The people in need of rescue continues, unabated sometimes. And then they realize they had a third friend that jumped in the water with them. And they finally spot her, and she's further upstream from where they are, swimming away from them. And uh, she's saving lives as, as she's going. She's rescuing people. But uh, it's a very odd scene because those two friends who are downstream rescuing and the rest of us who are looking at this whole scene, we're like, where is she going? I mean, there's, there are sure. people here to save. So they shout to her, where are you going? And she shouts back, I'm going to find out who or what is throwing these people in the water. I tell that parable a lot. I say it a lot primarily because when I was working in that clinic in South Central, when I was working with homeless veterans, when I uh, was working with the rural immigrant workforces, when I think about all my experiences and the experiences of my peers in healthcare, it's clear that the uh, up until this point, the existing story that we tell ourselves of who we are is largely limited to the downstream rescuer, specialist, the trauma surgeon, the ICU nurse, the emergency room case, case manager. Absolutely. These are critical people. We uh, absolutely need them. They're vital. Rescuers are essential, but they're not sufficient. And we know we have a second model, which is um, the primary care workforce. Incredibly essential. We need far more of them than I think we have these days. But there is something that's incomplete about that story. And what I've realized in talking with mentors and with peers and people now that I'm privileged to mentor myself is that there's, the, there's a long lineage of people who have always been in the healthcare system, healthcare professionals, who have been thinking about how to systematically find out who or what is throwing people in the water. Mm -hmm. 
the so-called upstreamist is uh, the type of person I wanted to be in a, as, a, as a doctor in a healthcare system. And that's the upstream parable and the way I try to adapt it and tell it. That makes so much sense. I mean, it really does. Keeping the parable in mind, how is it that someone's work and home life affects their health so much? It's interesting. I think we're we're seeing a lot of uh, science now emerging that articulates exactly how uh, issues like food insecurity, which is a when a household just doesn't have enough uh, to make ends meet, specifically to afford enough food, affordable, healthy food, or um, science that's emerging to delineate how lack of access to transportation or social isolation, especially for the elderly, how these particular experiences, whether it's acute episodes or it's a longitudinal experience over time, how those things can uh, directly lead to changes not just in health behaviors, like how often you go to the doctor or not, how often you can go seek services or go to the emergency department or not. But it also has, uh, there's a lot of science emerging now about the, the physiologic um, consequences of this as well. So let's take food insecurity, for example. We, we know that food insecurity is, uh, is directly linked to diabetes and the risk of developing diabetes. In fact, in some research uh, that has come about in the past five years uh, demonstrates in, with some really strong methodology that food insecurity itself, even after controlling for income and education and other socioeconomic factors, that just having food insecurity, not having enough as a household to be able to um, make ends meet and afford the right um, high-quality food, that phenomenon is independently linked as a risk factor to the development of diabetes. Food insecure households have more than three times the risk of developing diabetes than food secure households in, in the U.S. That's profound, and that's after controlling for other factors. So if you're in a food insecure household, your chances of actually developing diabetes are higher. Now, why is that? Well, some of the science hypothesizes really that it may be because that feast or famine phenomenon, when you uh, have limited access to good quality food, when the food that you can't access is, and that's cheap is not uh, nutritious, when it's calorie and you know energy dense but not nutrient dense, right? Um, when it's not good healthy food, when it's not vegetables and fruit, but it's instead a you know a cheeseburger uh, mm -hmm. or you know the, the 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 dollar deal at whatever your fast food restaurant of choice is. When when that's what's affordable for a family that's food insecure, what ends up happening with the feast or famine, and, and particularly when the feast is a unhealthy, physiologically unhealthy kind of feast, is this derangement of the metabolism of not just glucose, but the impacts it has on how your insulin levels go up and down. And that roller coaster ride that is happening with your pancreas and the rest of your hormonal system and how insulin is metabolized itself may be the thing that's actually creating this chronic inflammatory state that's leading to diabetes. This, these are hypotheses coming out right now that um, have some good evidence to suggest that this is, this is what's happening. So not only is food insecurity itself a confounder of a lot of health conditions and contributing to, you know, making it difficult to just control these conditions. If you're a diabetic and you're food insecure, it's, it's actually much harder to even control your diabetes. But it, food insecurity itself, uh, much like the, the emerging science around other upstream factors, other social determinants, may itself actually be a, a one cause of developing the disease in itself. So we're, we're just at the beginning, I think, of understanding the physiologic impacts of this, but frankly, it doesn't take a lot of science to demonstrate what is common sense, right? If you are sure. in a food insecure household, you're probably going to experience a lot of the psychological and physical stress that uh, is unhealthy and, and chronically going to lead to um, different factors. I, like Veronica and other patients, I've had conversations with patients who, who say, I, I've, um, uh, I've, had, I've had a hard time falling asleep, and I say, why? And they're like, well, you know... Um, I wake up a lot at night. Oh, why? Well, um, the bed bugs. Oh, got it. So you're chronically <laughs> sleepy at work because you can't sleep at night and because the bed bugs are kind of thing. And well, what have you done about the bed bugs? Well, we've tried to do it, but you know, it's uh, it's just hard to kind of um, address this. You know, there's it's, it's common sense. Everybody's experienced some degree of the link between what happens in their home life or their work life and stress and the impacts mm -hmm. on their health. Everybody knows that, but. Uh, the question is, uh, when when can we get to a healthcare system that um, that is equipped to be able to say, ah, you have that stress in your home. Now, not only can I help you deal with the consequences of that stress in your environment, but we can think about how to give you the resources you need to be able to take care of it. So I, I, there's there's a lot that's emerging right now. It's a fascinating time um, to be to frankly be involved in caregiving because uh, and to be a healthcare professional because we're 
we're learning about the the breadth and the depth of tools that we can start to use and um, agnostic of whether it's part of the old traditional kind of orthodoxy of what we used or not. I'm, whatever works is whatever my patients need. And if it means partly moving upstream, then whatever it takes. Absolutely. So, and you've talked before about how physicians aren't the only ones who who can be upstreamist. It can be other people as well. Can you kind of talk about sure. who else can be an upstreamist? Yeah. So, I think a couple things. One, the way I describe the upstreamist um, in one respect means that in every system, in any clinic or any hospital, I think there's got to be at least one upstreamist. And what I mean by that is someone who's formally responsible, someone, someone who's got the authority, you know, the job description that mm -hmm. says, my job is to screen, find out who or what is throwing people in the water. Right? Sure. My job is to make sure that I'm collecting social needs information or at least managing the team that's collecting that. And then helping the downstream rescuer and the primary care teams, the raft builders, understand if there are addressable causes. Let's go back to food insecurity and diabetes. Um, in California, and this is there's more research now demonstrating this in other states, there was a definitive piece of work that demonstrated that low-income adults who have diabetes uh, and food insecurity have almost a 30% higher risk of being hospitalized at the end of the month compared to non to food insecure households, right? So in other words, uh, food insecurity is driving unnecessary hospitalizations at a rate that's 30% higher. Well, that's a if you're a hospital system trying to reduce unnecessary admissions, trying to prevent readmissions, as is starting to be you know, the case, of course, because of Medicare you know, and other payment reforms, well, have we asked ourselves what we can do about food insecurity right, as, a, as an addressable cause? So there's, um, there's a lot that can be done as an extremist, and the, one of the, the, the definitions I use is to say, first, it, somebody's got to have the job of being... Um, being responsible, right, for making sure the system is working in a way that is aligned to identify upstream needs for not just Mrs. for for Veronica and people, but for the entire population they serve. Who's your upstreamist in your healthcare system is the first kind of way I've, I pose that question. But to your point, um, it doesn't have to be an MD, uh, you know, uh, who is the upstreamist. And there are some healthcare systems up there out, out in, the, in, the, in the country right now where uh, a nurse, a chief quality officer who is a chief nursing officer is the lead upstreamist, is the person who's looking at social determinants and information. You, uh, you have then other people who are upstreamists, um, who are part of the upstreamist kind of workforce in general, community health workers, case managers, social workers, um, a lot of navigators and volunteers sometimes even. Um, and then those people who are not even employed by the healthcare system but are partnering with them. So we're seeing now this incredible surge of uh, the number of hospitals that are partnering with food banks to create and, and large kind of community organizations to be able to get food to people who are food insecure. Wow. We're seeing the rise of food pharmacies, which is essentially just a, a, a fancy way of talking about a food pantry, but a food pantry that's linked to a hospital, linked to a clinic, and linked to programs to, that help specific populations like diabetics get better. You're, you're, we're seeing all sorts of upstreamists, if, if you will, that are out in the workforce right now, both in the clinical and the community side of the house. But um, uh, while that's essential and, and we have to grow that workforce, uh, the, the key point I want to come back to is that at least the, the buck's got to stop somewhere. Somebody in the healthcare system has to be responsible for opening the door to community partners, to identifying the data that we need to make our system stronger, better, more efficient, more impactful, making them better. Um, and uh, Part of the responsibility is in making sure that we identify the upstreamist. Somebody's job uh, has got to be that. Because if it's not that person's job, then it's nobody's job. So we have a program here at Texas Health called Clinic Connect. We talked about the program in a previous podcast. For those who don't know, it's a Texas Health program that provides grant dollars to local charitable clinics to enable the clinics to provide care to area patients. In 2016, its first year in existence, Clinic Connect already had provided more than $700,000 to area clinics, and we're looking to add to that total. We launched this program last year because we saw a need in our communities, even if we weren't familiar with the term upstreaming. So aside from a program like Clinic Connect, what more can healthcare systems like Texas Health do to move forward addressing this upstream mentality? Well, from what I've read about Clinic Connect, and I'll just mention two things I'm a fan of. First, from what I understand of Clinic Connect, the ability to invest in creating more points of access for uh, for patients, especially in uh, to access primary care with a lot of the community clinics that are receiving the grant funding, that makes total sense, right? It doesn't make sense to have the hospital be the place where you receive primary care. Have it be the community. And so building up that capacity is a no-brainer. It's building up the rafts, right? That's a Clinic Connect sounds like a, an ideal kind of raft building intervention that, again, is 
common sense necessary. The rest of us who've uh, amassed along the banks of the river <laughs> should applaud it, right? That's, that's <laughs> exactly right. So I'm, count me as one of those fans. The second thing that I thought was interesting in the reading that I did about it was you're connecting financial and outcome metrics to this, starting to look at how to measure the impact of this, not just give a grant and say, hmm. good luck to you and do good work, but it's saying, let's make sure that good work is measurable, demonstrable. Let's make sure it, you know, let's, it's changing the health outcomes. Let's make sure it's, it's aligning with what we need to do in this whole region to be able to improve the care of people. So there's a, a lot to be said for the way in which Texas Health Resources is, is leveraging its own performance management and kind of quality improvement framework to the extent that that's what's happening sure. here is, is happening. I, 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 that's what I read into what, um, what the Clinic Connect program is doing right now. It's looking at ways to um, create accountability and monitoring, but also drive higher performance, and that's great. The question that you raise is a good one, which is, you know, what more? Well, you know, before anybody who is listening to this and knows about what's happening in uh, the Clinic Connect program or any other program that you're sponsoring says, well, we're doing a lot already, you know, you know, cut us some slack, you know, <laughs> give us some credit. Uh, that I, I want to say a amen, right? Like there's um, being in healthcare itself is a lot to begin with, right? Doing good, being a good doctor, being a good nurse, being a good social worker, being a good hospital is uh, is no small feat, <laughs> right? <laughs> you're spinning a lot of plates at the same time. You got to keep the lights on while you're taking care of patients, Absolutely. et cetera. So I'm the last to say do more as if uh, the stuff you're doing already isn't important, right? This is, this is not about um, an either or scenario or about disrespecting, frankly, the incredible amount of uh, passion and talent that exists in the healthcare workforce, and it sounds like it exists here, of course, at Texas Health Resources. I think that the the question is not maybe not how to do more. I, w I would say about how do how do we do better, right? And, Absolutely. And I think that if we can uh, build on that last point uh, that I read into the Clinic Connect program, which is how the your your hospital system is raising the bar for performance expectations, providing resources to say, hey, here's some measures, here's some ways we can evaluate, you know, how this is working. Let's figure out how to support you in the clinics that we're giving grants to, to, to really kind of uh, hit your mark. The hospitals have a, a lot of experience in um, quality improvement and looking at ways to reduce hospital-acquired infections and improve patient satisfaction scores. The, the, the level of granularity with the data that hospitals have to be able to move uh, metrics of quality is, is powerful. And sometimes it's actually the, you know, the infrastructure that they have is sometimes much greater than what exists out in the community level. If you're a small community clinic that's barely trying to keep your lights on to meet your mission to serve um, populations that would otherwise go without, right, uninsured populations especially, then you, you probably don't have the bandwidth to actually invest in a major quality improvement shop. You don't have the Lean Six Sigma you know, uh, ninjas who are helping to <laughs> implement these things. But the hospital does. And I think what actually doing better means is in thinking about how hospitals, those who have privilege relative to the members in the community, can not only um, provide grants and, and, but also drive performance by thinking about how to build up the capability of our clinical and our community partners outside the hospital to do quality improvement, to m move past a system where they might just be using paper systems and instead use automated things. Let's, let's improve the efficiencies of uh, the capabilities of that food bank. If the food bank is using post-it notes and we're using predictive analytics, then maybe we can do something about building up their capacity. Because if the more they do and the better they do, then the easier it is for us to actually take care of patients and keep them healthy in the hospital. Right. right. So there's a. I think that's that's what doing better means to me. Um, investing in the performance management capability of your upstream partners, your community partners, and including the community clinics. I think do better. Doing better also means beyond being aware of social needs and why they are important in general in a vague sense. Thinking about how to apply professional rigor, right, to doing this work. If I want to be a happy and satisfied doctor, if I if I want to work with a group of colleagues on my care team or in my hospital, nurses and social workers and care managers and uh, the, the the building and maintenance folks and the, and the and the food and beverage guys and you know everybody, anybody who's responsible for, for keeping our our hospital system working at the top of its game. What I also want to do is say that. Being able to understand how to precisely listen and evaluate somebody who has an unmet social need is part of my it can make me happier too. Right, I, part of being at the top of my game in terms of um, a good doctor or a good hospital, I think, is learning how to identify ways to screen for food insecurity and housing insecurity, and then knowing more importantly what I can do if somebody screens positive. So, in other words, doing better means let's let's give each other uh, the tools that are out that are already out there to be able to screen for these things. There's something called for example, the hunger vital sign. 
Hunger Vital Sign is a well-validated screening item. It's two questions, two questions that has been well-validated in the clinical world. Uh, it's got a 83 to 96 percent sensitivity and, a, and a similar specificity to be able to discern if somebody in the last 12 months has had food insecurity. Not a lot of our hospitals in general in the country right now are using the hunger vital sign, but it's starting to happen. Our large EMR, EMR vendors um, are starting to incorporate this because of pressure from payers mm -hmm. and hospitals. So the hunger vital sign is something that's sitting there on the shelf. The researchers have done the hard work to actually evaluate its validity. The vendors have done some work to be able to make it available to us in our electronic medical record tools. And now it's up to us to actually take it off the shelf and say, ah, that's it. Now let's be rig rigorous. Let's not talk about food insecurity. Let's not let our eyes roll when we think about, you know, upstream issues. How, what are we going to do about that? Let's not, let's not get lost in paralysis or paralysis analysis, right? Or, uh, let, let's actually <laughs> do something and use the tools that are right in front of our noses. And the hunger vital sign is just one of many examples of specific tools that are already out there. And that's what's exciting about this moment. It's no longer about why we should do this. It's, what's exciting is that there are people out there saying, here's how we can. So we don't have to worry about whether it's possible to move upstream. We just have to um, ask ourselves if we're ready to do it. Well, thanks, Dr. Monchanda, for talking with us today. That's going to do it for today's episode of the Texas Health Out Loud podcast. At Texas Health, we're partnering with you for a better North Texas. To hear more Texas Health Out Loud podcasts, visit our website at texashealth.org backslash out loud. You can also subscribe to our podcast on iTunes and Google Play. I'm Alicia Howe. Thanks for joining us for Texas Health Out Loud. Out Loud.